Um, cool, Filecoin master plan. Who remembers what the next two things are in the Filecoin master plan? Start with amassing massive amount of storage hardware. What's after that? It's, uh, fill it with, with useful data. Fill it with useful data. Okay, what's the third? Compute over the data. Compute over the data. Awesome. So, hardware, data, compute. Hardware, data, compute. Hardware, data, compute. Yes. Everyone, have it in your head. Easy, easy to remember. We should all be able to say this. If anyone asks us in any of the awesome things that are happening later this week, we know what's going on. And what's our end res strategy, starting from the bottom? What's down here? Keep critical, keep critical system stewardship. Keep critical systems running. I'll take any of them. All accurate. Making sure this is our foundation. If this breaks down, everything breaks down. Things need to stay secure. Things need to constantly be growing and scaling to their new usage and adoption. And we need to be running and releasing these systems quickly as well. So this is our uh, framework for improving them over time and growing their, their adoption. What's after that? Hand? Oh, no, sh don't look at your tables. <laughs> what, what's, what's above critical system stewardship? What's next? Number two. <laughs> Trolls. What, what, what is the wording next to number two? grow talent in the network and growing talent in our team. Um, so this is where we are bringing in new capabilities. So that might be hiring new humans into our team, um, but this might also be scaling talent into the network on behalf of other teams. And of course, this is doing our work in a network native way. So um, events that we are participating in, like all of Lab Week, like IPFS Camp, uh, Phil Lisbon, et cetera, um, but also hosting our own events so that we can get work done with the teams that we need to coordinate with. One thing out there, uh, we now have a number of working groups emerging with our own uh, virtual workshops and so on. Uh, that's likely going to uh, double down and grow next year. So things like the COD working group, things like the IPVM working group, a bunch of the, we're finally reaching the scale. We tried a long time ago, we tried to generate um, a lot of this. And it, it stuck around with a few teams. So uh, the IPLD team, um, the IPFS uh, call and so on, a few of them have been running strong for, for years. We're now seeing many more groups adopting that working group structure. So a lot of this growing team and network might happen through those virtual workshops too. Uh, so if you want to work on a set of problems with other people in other uh, groups and other ecosystems, consider leaning on one of those structures. What is number three? Number three in our strategy for next year. Don't look at your tables. Someone tell me. Storage and retrieval. Storage and retrieval. Core of what we do. Make this robust. Make this scale. Make this fast. This is performance, this is making sure that user errors are very low, and it's making sure that humanity's information stored in Filecoin is really useful, and that people can actually build on top of IPFS and get access to all of that data um, and driving adoption with users. Four, compute over data and state, uh, or state and data, whichever way. Um, FVM, new capabilities, in the storage network so that we are launching new things on top of FVM, more chain space, things like IPC, and making sure that we actually have compute over data, COD. Cool, so that's our strategy. It is in front of you, so you can always look at it there. Um, feel free to take one of these cards home with you to remember closely, put it on your wall, stare at it every day, resonate with it. Um, but we're, the aim is that we are gonna keep this constant this also shouldn't be surprising. These exactly map to the things that we were doing last year. Keeping things running, talent funnel, robust storage and retrieval, literally we didn't even change the, the title on that one. Um, and then compute, this was breakthroughs, but really many of our breakthroughs are leading to compute um, and bringing the capabilities we need to make that happen. Um, so these were our, our top level principles that we went over yesterday. Um, optimize and scale. A big thing there is measuring. I think this is something that maybe a number of teams in their roadmaps haven't fully integrated into their thinking, how we are going to measure our performance, measure our reliability, um, get the data we need to accelerate development within our teams and across the network. And so you'll see that in half a second. Um, shipping things, I think we're all aware of that. Teams are very excited to ship their stuff to real users. But if you're not actually generating impact with users who are using your stuff, doesn't count yet. Um, end user product and UX. We have, we have high goals here. We are on an improvement gradient towards it. Crossing the chasm does not happen overnight. 
Web3 as a whole has not done it yet, uh, but this is what we're building towards. So start building in those deep levels of reliability so that we can upgrade um, over and over time and that it's smooth for many different types of clients who want to consume it. Um, and then this is, this is around growing the, the talent in the network, growing our own capabilities, but doing our work really openly and actively with the community. So roadmap tools, great. That's the sort of uh, outcome that can help strengthen our collaboration within the network. Just reminders, reminders of, of the things that, you know, as you think about your team's roadmap, and we now spend this time together um, refining it, remember some of these principles, make sure that, that you're um, figuring out how to incorporate those goals into your work. Um, cool, I should have done the, anyways, uh, just like last year, um, we have kind of like high level uh, OKRs as it, that map one to one to each of those goal areas. Now, obviously this was done yesterday and so it hasn't had enough feedback. We need to sit down together as kind of like org leads to talk about how this work actually translates into very different teams. But I wanted to make it one layer more concrete than the beautiful strategy you have in front of you in terms of what does this look like to actually go forth and achieve this strategy in the next, I think, six months. That was about the time frame we were doing on things. Um, and so what, what might some of those kind of like goals or sub bullet points within each of those objectives look like? So starting with critical um, system stewardship, um, this is growing the, the systems safely and robustly. So this is you know, definitely security and really, really good um, kind of like burn down of, of issues. Um, but, but it's also a lot of other things. And so um, one, I literally just copied this from the IPFS uh, Kubo roadmap, catalyzing, uh, actually I think I changed the word to catalyze, but catalyzing growth of additional IPFS clients and implementations. Um, that's a key part of growth, but it's growth from a network native, network oriented way. Creating a robust automated benchmarking system for lib P2P that maps performance gaps. Um, we're doing some of this with test ground right now, running on each PR, but if you're going to reach the level of Chrome or uh, Firefox or uh, many other testing suites that really give good feedback to development teams on where their gaps are with users, you need thousands, tens of, I don't know, you need lots of benchmarks running on each of those PRs that's not just like, hey, did they interop, but like, is there a good experience for people who are building their applications on top of our tech? Is it working? Is it fast? Um, I'm sure the lib P2P team is like, yes, please, if we're going to make it fast, we need a, a gradient that we are working against. So let's make that gradient. Um, again, these are placeholders. We are going to work on these. We're going to refine these. We're going to make sure we have something good later. Um, something, something, IPFS and Filecoin network infrastructure and uptime. Um, we should define this more clearly. I think uh, making sure that uptime is a defined term uh, that we're clear about is really important. This might also split into two, but my slide was not going to fit. Um, and so that's, that's a really important, it's very core to this goal. Um, making sure that we actually grow usage and adoption. This is probably going to be something in partnership with the outer core and ecosystem team. Um, but if we stay static, we die. So we need to be growing. Otherwise, we're not going to reach Mars. Um, we're not going to reach real user adoption, right? Like, you know, if we, if we stay at the, what is it, like maybe 3,000 repos today are building on top of IPFS in GitHub, obviously there's more users who are not using GitHub and other things like that, but that's nowhere near the two million users that are writing in Rust, or developers that are writing in Rust, that's nowhere near all of the applications being built on the internet actually building upon IPFS and Filecoin. So we have, we have to grow in order to reach that, that adoption space. Um, this, what, this is around dog fooding and actually, maybe dog fooding is not quite the right word. It's transitioning our usage from web two to web three systems. Now that we have things like Saturn coming online, harnessing that opportunity um, to cut our costs to centralized infrastructure and replace it with our own infrastructure. Every uh, file coin that we spend on Saturn has multiple you know, values that it delivers um, into the wider ecosystem versus every dollar we give to AWS is a dollar that they that then get to go spend on AWS marketing. So um, let's, let's use our own tools and let's find ways that we can be more efficient and more cost conscious while doing that. I think we also just have a lot of room to cut here, period. We have a lot of latent resources that we're spending on things that we don't need. Let's use that money for other things. Um, and so, 
uh, th thinking of ways to do that. Remember the macro environment, we want to cut costs in a ton of ways as much as possible uh, to conserve. Uh, and let's cut down, let's both like cut down the spending and whatever we do spend, let's try and spend it in our community so that it's much more useful to us. Yeah, we, we want to go fund lots of amazing development teams or developers who are building on our tech. So if we flow those resources into our ecosystem, it has you know, lots, lots of benefits for all of us and for this you know, whole PL network as well. Um, there's a lot of work happening and has been happening over the past couple of months about making sure that we are snapshotting our chain and doing upgrades. Let's make that actually stored in Filecoin. Let's actually be using our own storage networks and, and demonstrating how a blockchain should use Filecoin to store its chain state and ideally bootstrap out of its chain state as well. So we had a, we had a good conversation about that um, two days ago as well. Um, so that's a, uh, an exciting area. We'd love to see us push forward in. Um, and then there's like, you know, kind of some of these uh, projects that were in, you know, not, uh, not IPFS and Filecoin, but are like significant, amazing projects that we have built that we use super heavily and is critical to us getting our work done. Let's gain broader adoption for those as well. We have, um, you know, kind of like awesome Web3 infra tools, um, and we need to be sharing those with the wider community and driving adoption for them as well. Um, placeholder, XXX, maybe it's a percentage, maybe it's something else, but you know, actually bringing DRAND, libp2p, test ground into, deeper into the Web3 community and gaining usage for them. Um, this is nowhere complete, question mark, question mark, question mark. I probably missed like 12 things. It was 3 o'clock in the morning. But um, this maybe gives you a little bit deeper. For example, I, I think I missed a lot of things around releasing on a regular cadence or um, making sure that we engage really effectively with our communities. So lots of Lots of oversights, this will probably end up much longer, but hopefully gives you a slightly different, uh, deeper peek into what stewarding critical systems actually looks like. Um, I'm gonna have to speed up because time and I want you to get to, to discussion. Um, leveling up team and network capabilities. Um, we need to hire, and we definitely need to hire more, more folks at the leadership level to help scale folks like me, um, but also really help support a lot of the coordination and alignment that needs to happen between teams here, um, whether that's investing in tools or whether that's um, helping make sure that we just are better staffed at um, a people management layer. That's something we've been working on. We've made some progress, but we still have room to go. Um, so staffing up um, at that level, definitely a big focus. Um, burning down bus factor. Um, I think there was, this is on like the JS IPFS side, making sure that we don't have teams with less than two bus factor. Either we need to make sure that we staff that next person so no one is, you know, holding the world on their shoulders alone, or we need to make the hard decision that this isn't something that we want to invest in at that point in time. Again, I don't think the case for JS IPFS, but, but the sort of thing where if we have people who are like we have, you know, a third of a third of a third of a person, like, we're, we're not making that person effective. We're churning them constantly. Um, you know, is, is that the thing that we want to be spending time on or can we actually focus better in the short term? And so... Cancel or freeze, right? So we can yeah, yeah. Or pause. set something down for a period of time. Uh, things, not everything will break if you like, stop it in a moment. Yeah. So, but, and it's also is, you know, okay, if you're, if you're not going to have people staffed against this, you need to recognize that you're actually dosing other people who then get pulled in when you know something that, that's critical that we're depending on needs to be improved and so that's a, a visibility level that we then need to go um, we need to recognize and account for that as we are um, thinking about how we're actually allocating resources to projects um, Oh, taking leadership within these communities and growing the implementer and developer communities. So super core to network native development and, um, and the work we're doing there. But for example, participating in key events, running and, and um, spawning key events like the IPFS thing, um, making sure that we're really engaging seamlessly with the, the network and with the other teams we need to work with and taking a leadership role in accelerating the number of other developers who are participating here as well. Um, this is a, a more around metrics and tools, making sure that we have the capabilities, maybe that's humans in our team, more folks on the DX side of things or more folks on, on the benchmarking side of things so that we have those capabilities to also invest much, much more in metrics, um, automation, uh, visibility into performance, et cetera. Um, 
and also we have a lot of things that we need to ship. Maybe those teams need staffing in order to ship um, and, and gain significant adoption. And so where, where we um, need to uh, staff up teams with say like more product folks or more designers or um, other resources that have different capability sets, that should, that should fit into this goal. Question mark, question mark, we'll add more stuff to this. Hyperscaling fast retrievals. Um, this should be not surprising, um, but 100, I mean, these are placeholder numbers, so talk to me if this is completely crazy. Um, but I think, I think doable. I mean, I downloaded Station. I did 50,000 uh, uh, Saturn retrieval deals yesterday. Um, it's beautiful, and I think it's totally feasible where you have a, a, a payment system um, to achieve a significant number of active retrieval nodes. By the way, this, uh, I think... Uh, Bitcoin has 15,000, so this would make us the largest uh, blockchain network in the world, I think, which would be pretty cool. It'd be pretty cool. By number of nodes, yeah. Um, integrating Saturn into the IPFS gateways, and through that, using that to drive time to first byte down even more. Both of those things are important, but hopefully having the synergy between those two to achieve them together would be amazing. And there's an end of a sentence, again, 3 o'clock in the morning. Um, making sure that we measure, measure, measure our retrievals and that we feed that measurement into reputation. I don't know where Marina is in this room, but I know that's definitely an area of, of uh, intense discussion happening at the Retrieval Markets um, Summit tomorrow. Um, but this is super important. If we don't have this feedback loop, I was looking at the um, dashboard that Jacob was presenting yesterday of like, what are the top reasons that re uh, retrieval deals are failing right now? And it's access denied, access denied, too many retrieval requests to the storage provider. Um, there's a couple other ones as well, but like a number of them, uh, I guess access control of like maybe the client told me not to share this data, but um, we need a lot of visibility into that. And we need that to hone our development roadmap and to make our projects actually deliver amazing user experiences. So um, measure, 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 and use the, use the feedback loop to um, help everyone prioritize the storage, create, create an incentive gradient for storage providers to uh, behave really awesomely in this ecosystem. Um, otherwise, the user, you know, what's the incentive for them? Uh, and, and there's an additional cost in serving retrieval, so why would they? Um, also, a ton of work. I mean, this obviously very important and drives a lot of work in things like uh, Boost, Lotus Miner, other places, um, but this also encompasses making sure that we're continuing to onboard new data really effectively and we're scaling as that adoption curve uh, increases. So we've hit three pebabytes per day. We still need to maintain that, but if we're projecting five pebabytes, maybe even more per day next year, we need to be upgrading our tools to help support and drive that increased onboarding rate um, kind of at a technical level. So boost you know, obviously has areas to, to improve to, to keep making that scale, and Lotus Miner also has areas to improve to, to do that growth. Um, and right now, I think we're at 25, 26% of all data is being um, indexed and stored in Boost. I think those are about the same number. Um, let's try and get those to 75%, maybe. Again, placeholder number, but 75% uh, six months from now, I guess a little more than six months from now, uh, nine, eight months from now, um, would, be, would be pretty cool. Pretty cool to, to actually be gaining um, the, that data stored there and then making it accessible to IPFS Gateway, Saturn, and Kubo. And again, many more things here that I'm probably not thinking of um, and, and didn't list. Um, and last but not least, driving adoption for computation. Um, obviously, shipping FVM, gaining massive adoption from um, actual developers and developers who are shipping contracts making sure that those contracts actually get a lot of usage. Um, I initially wrote 1 billion fill, maybe that's a little aggressive, uh, but like 20 million, 200 million fill, like I, I could see it. This is um, all of the, the ways in which people might use smart contracts to make new storage markets or to make uh, persistent storage deals or to make loans to large storage providers. Um, there, there's a lot to be transacted there in terms of flowing value into the core capabilities within Filecoin. And the more capabilities you have, the more value can flow in there. Um, and so let's actually drive that. Um, total value ma managed is something that Raul came up with as an iteration 
on total value locked, because we're not DeFi. We don't just want to like lock money up in contracts for funsies. We want to actually deploy it into storage deals, into storage provider operations, into collateral in the network. So it doesn't need to be locked in a contract. We want it to be um, put to work inside Filecoin to generate um, a lot of amazing development and growth. Um, something something users of L2 Filecoin capabilities. So we want to see those capabilities actually getting harnessed in the real world. Um, would love to see people actually putting up bounties for retrieval incentives and storage providers, you know, having having that that incentive gradient to make their data accessible. Um, and then we have a lot of things to ship. Shipping IPC and driving adoption. Shipping Bacalao and driving adoption. Um, Maybe something, a uh, proof of concept for IPVM MVP early stages um, to get, get a first, first thing out the door around, around that future breakthrough. Um, and these are all part of those interconnected adoption goals. So um, I spent too much time on this, but um, overview on like how we might actually break some of these things out and how they fit, how the things you're working on, your roadmaps, um, fit into that broader picture. Um, and we'll, again, iterate on these. Feedback, very welcome. Um, they probably won't be, uh, we'll, we'll present them at the beginning of the year once we've had a lot of time to workshop them um, and improve them with other people, uh, just like we did at the beginning of this year. Uh, so I'm gonna go through um, these once more, uh, just so again, like touch on them again. Repetition is good, it helps us all remember things. And I'll annotate with a few, uh, a few more thoughts. Um, so, uh, in this one, this create a robust automated benchmarking system and so on, uh, we, we need to kind of spec what we need here um, and kind of where are we at the moment and where we need to grow into. Um, this, this layer um, is, is gonna be extremely important because we're now, we're now definitely past the scale where we're being rate limited by, by our inability to know the changes that we make and the impact that those changes have on the rest uh, of the system and the rest of the network. So. Um, we need to get to a point where as you're writing a PR, you have a totally automated way of knowing how that PR shift is gonna affect the feature sets and the performance across the network. And we need to use computers to tell us like how well we're doing. And that's not just for your team, it's for all of the dependent teams and the teams beyond that that might be like introducing PRs and so on. Our community is now in the many thousands of people that are collaborating across repos. We're well past, like we, 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 the infrastructure, we're trying to like operate with like too little infrastructure and too little automation. So we need, this is like a big investment for us. Um, and then the usage on growth on 10X, we have to define which one specifically on this kind of range. Um, but IPFS specifically, um, so we, because of a lot of our focus on Filecoin, um, and uh, we didn't focus on IPFS as much, so we sort of like delayed the growth and adoption of IPFS, so now we have to like steepen the curve for a while to sort of like get back on track. Um, a lot of these, these growth numbers are based on very long-term goal setting of like many years and thinking about the growth rates across many years to end with certain kinds of adoption, you know, after, you know, five, ten, uh, ten years kind of range of things. And so that's kind of like why that's, why that's steep. Um, on this one, uh, one thing I wanted to also add here, here's what I mentioned earlier around workshops and with uh, working groups. So there's probably a set of areas where there are now, there's a strong need for a working group, especially across the ecosystem. There are um, many other groups that want to work on these kinds of things. For example, private data. How do you deal with private data properly? That's one key component. Uh, there might be a working group around what should go into Filecoin deals and how do you reason about other in information that needs to be tracked in deals. So for example, whether or not this should be retrievable, whether or not this should be indexed, whether or not this is like needs to be going into Filecoin green and so on. Those are th requirements that people have circulated around uh, Filecoin deals they're, they're, and that's coming from many different teams. So there's, there probably needs to be some kind of work, working group around that kind of thing. So leaning into the working group structure um, I think will be really helpful. Uh, and, and here I mean like open source oriented working groups where you have like, you know, some page somewhere or like a repo and you have like some kind of um, continued way of like making progress on, on specifications and documentation of things and making decisions as a, as a community. Um, on this one, so th this particular end-to-end -end retrieval measurement, testing, reputation, incentives, uh, we also need to spec that one. That is kind of like a project into itself. That is not a, 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 an easy thing. This does not just mean within our current projects, get end-to-end -end retrieval testing. This means an additional thing, 
um, across the entire network, how do we know that all of the stuff that should be retrievable is actually able to be retrieved from everywhere in the world? How do we test that on an ongoing basis? How do we get performance measurements? Like with what bandwidth is it retrievable? With what latency is it retrievable? And then how to use all of that information to then drive incentives in the network. So part of the deal of storage um, uh, providers is that they don't, don't just have to store the data, they have to serve the data. They have to make it retrievable. Um, so that might feed into um, coupling to the, to the Falcon Plus incentives or just the straight um, uh, storage uh, providing incentives. Um, but we have to create like extremely good and robust ways of getting very high quality data first, describing where the problems are, figuring out, giving the network a way to improve the problems, and then at that point later, driving that into the, into the incentives. Um, as, we, as we touched on earlier, like a lot of reliance on, on, um, on, on Saturn and Station to drive a lot of this thinking. So th that, this thing might end up with, a, with another tool that like deploys through Station or that uses Saturn or something like that to then get this measurement. So like getting hundreds of active requests. And by the way, um, whenever you wonder what, like where's the demand for a lot of these tools, we, we have our own problems that we need to solve with these things, right? We have demand for these computers everywhere in the world to like um, hammer the network and give us these performance measurements um, and so on to th then help bu build the thing, right? So it's very useful to like be able to use and dog food our own, our own stuff. Um, in the driving adoption for computation, um, some of these things are, and there's probably a, a, another ones here, like you know, Medusa and a few other things that likely uh, along with these might turn into um, networks, right? So for example, DRAN itself, um, there's been discussion for a long time, it's like, oh, should that be, should there be like a DRAN oriented blockchain network at some point? What's gonna happen with VDFs? There's a bunch of questions like this. There are many projects that have been kind of like, oh, this, this should be kind of like its own L2 or its own network um, into, in its own right. Um, this, we're, we're gonna have to deal with that set of questions this year and figure out a good pathway to, uh, to enabling a lot of these things to, um, to, to become those networks. Um, the FEM, having, landing the FEM and having the ability to use smart contracts directly on, on Falcon was one of the um, big major uh, things. One important thing is like, how do we think about the crypto econ of these other L2 networks and create like a super robust, strongly reinforcing um, set of economies? Because a lot of these, especially if you create a new network, we're booting up a new economy. And so when we boot up a new economy, we wanna make it um, like very reciprocal and like very successful growing together. Um, one thing I would add here, uh, we should consider adding um, to Aynard's point yesterday, um, so from like the pitch session yesterday, adding a very explicit thing about connectivity and bridges. Um, bridges and, and composability and modularity have been in our slides for years. Like we, one of the, there's this slide that we use with Filecoin and all of the other blockchains and we draw like all these links across them and that's been like part of the message for, for a long time. But we now need to like, and, and there's been many projects to drive bridges and adoption and so on, but we now need to make it a strong KR for ourselves of saying, hey, like we need to prioritize the connectivity and interaction and you know, cross-chain uh, calling and so on. And that might involve data availability layers and, and so on um, to really be able to kind of enable any network out there to be able to store uh, data on Falcon and use it. Um, some of the stuff around being able to store the, the snapshots of, um, where were the snapshots? The, the snapshots of Filecoin, there we go, Filecoin chain state is stored and served from Filecoin. Being able to prototype this in a, in a chain agnostic way, being able to do this for all, for a bunch of other chains and showing how others should do this. I, this may, can make Filecoin a, a strong um, service that the rest of the blockchain world uses and that can self serve us also as an entry point for some of the data availability questions. Like so it, it is possible that some fraction of that might also turn into um, connectivity and, and, and uh, be able to like, Lead, many many protocols that people are designing now decouple like what data you need now from what data needs to be available long term, and that might be the, the these protocols lean on this for the available long term. Uh, cool, I think that's it. Yep. So we know that these are not final. This is a view into the world, um, given what we know today, and. One of the things we're doing is we're getting deep visibility um, synthesized from each of the different teams so we can identify if there are bugs, problems, areas that need better alignment, and we have time to iterate on those um, and time to iterate together uh, over the rest of this week. And so 
we're going to record these. We hope to publish them. If something goes haywire, we're, uh, that's, we can almost deal with it. Um, but also, we plan to still make changes. And so we know these aren't final. They're draft. Um, any questions about that? Maybe you covered it. I might have missed it. Um, do we want to, sometime today, um, start getting things to GitHub or not? No. Defer that later. Defer, defer getting things into GitHub. The aim is this is going to be so easy that you just update whatever roadmap is linked in that Endres road mapping doc, and myself or Talia or someone can go and copy paste from that into GitHub issues and be like, hey guys, here's we turned that doc into these five GitHub issues. You now own these. Please go continue to, to update and maintain them over time, um, and that things will get auto-populated. We didn't want to spend our small amount of time together copying and pasting into GitHub issues. And so um, also, the tool is still work in progress, and so we want to make sure that it we've uh, polished off some of those uh, rough edges. So we will do that after lab week, um, if that's OK with folks. Yeah, and if you, it, it might give you a good way of like thinking about how to structure this. So consider using your team if you have six six milestones, telling each person, like, you each do one milestone so you get a feel for how the things should work. Mm -hmm. Yep. That'll be even better. So instead of populating the book, uh, like, the doc, can we just, like, directly on the issues and there? Can people start, I mean, is, is there a place for us to start sticking issues if people really want to use, okay. use the tool? Your mileage may vary, but yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. You got it. And, and you can decide, I mean, you decide whether you want to keep it in your repo, in whatever repo you want to use. Or if you don't have a place to put it, we can put it in, uh, what was the repo there? Do we have a Google Maps repo that could be like a good placeholder for random things? I, I think, it, yeah, we can find a place for that. I, I mean, I think ideally you put it in the repo for your yeah. own project. Yeah. yeah. So it sounds like you can create issues in your own project roadmap and then you can link to them. And it's the power of the internet. Um, that sounds great. So yeah, feel free to, to create your set of issues. All right, so, um, uh, so we, we were all here for the session before. We were learning about all the goals that we have for the year and all of the challenges that we as an organization and as project teams we have and that we need to tackle. And sometimes we hear about, uh, it's all working, right? Um, and sometimes we hear about like, oh, like we need to hire an L6 or we need to uh, find a team to tackle on this project or we need to build a security team uh, to run audits for us and like, make sure that our code is always audited um, in, a, in a timely way. And uh, often this might sound like challenges that are beyond our scope or beyond our reach, something that some, someone else should uh, take on. Um, and so it might not be obvious if you are an IC or if you are a new to the organization on how actually to mobilize resources, conversations, planning to tackle on those challenges. But like, the reality is actually all of those things are within your reach. Like you are totally empowered to be able to take those on, ask around, figure out uh, how you can contribute and how to, you can make things better. And so um, there are multiple examples of this, like multiple people like jump all the time into these challenges and they help like helping a team structure the docs or help a team hire, hire someone or, uh, and the, ex the example list goes on and on and on. Awesome. So reminder, this is our Endres 2023 strategy. Hopefully everyone knows it by heart by now. Um, but we're going to go through uh, quick roadmap presentations from each of the different projects inside of Endres um, that are building on these areas, starting from the bottom to the top. Um, if you are working um, or, or you have a roadmap to share within the critical system stewardship uh, bucket. First is going to be uh, IP stewards. <laughs> IPFS stewards, um, but everyone in that area, yes? Ah, yes. <laughs> Launched into the world. Amazing. Um, first is probably going to be Reed, um, IPFS. Okay, so on the uh, IPFS steward side, uh, we have four main goals. Uh, the first is strengthen and grow the IPFS contributors community. We need to have more people pitching in and uh, helping us to move IPFS forwards. And so what can we do as stewards to help make that community healthier and bring more people under the uh, umbrella? So uh, new contributor guides, first issue guides, um, uh, setting up processes for issue triage and PRs, 
and handling those in a timely way. And uh, to help support those, we are looking at hiring a couple additional community engineers. Goal number two is uh, fully transitioning to dynamic content routing. So this has been a uh, journey we've been on for a while of uh, switching from using only the DHT to providing kind of a pluggable mechanism to talk to indexers. And what we want to kind of, we want to finish that off by also introducing a way of kind of like selecting what is the default. So when a Kubo node comes up or other implementations, they can go figure out what are the right content routers to use. And all right, and so that's number two. Number three, uh, catalyze the growth of additional clients and implementation. So we want to continue to see an ecosystem proliferate of new, uh, new IPFS implementations. So um, a few things we're doing there is uh, enabling verifiable retrieval. So that, that helps support light clients. So things like uh, clients running in browsers that are going to be using gateways heavily. Um, we want to change Kubo from the current model it's in into a library. So it's much easier for people to come in and uh, use Kubo functionality in building new clients to fit specific scenarios. And then uh, creating a first class, uh, so really doubling down on the specs. So we want, when you come in to build a new implementation, we want it to be very concrete, like this is how a correct IPFS implementation functions. And we also want to put in place the processes by which we will evolve those specs over time. So, so a lot of that's already in progress, but, um, and then finally, uh, we, you know, we can't improve what we can't measure. And uh, so we want to really prioritize with urgency getting in and developing a set of KPIs for IPFS. Uh, both figuring out what those KPIs should be and then also implementing the automation and dashboards necessary to, uh, to track those. So that's it. Thank you. I forgot. Yeah. These are, uh, by the way, this is the magic that happens with the roadmap tool is uh, you can screen cap these and put them in slides. So... Um, I'm not, uh, most of this is just what I've already said, so it's just laying that out on a timeline. Okay. Cool. So on the pro blog side, which I believe is next, uh, yeah, we're going to uh, hopefully collaborate a lot with the team at IPFS and other teams um, to look into how we can verify the correct operation of core star stack protocols. We're going to focus on the DHT and Gossip Sub for the foreseeable future. Uh, the DHT has got several aborts and timeouts that might not be optimally um, configured, so that we want to look into that. And Gossip Sub, of course, as we know, is a very central protocol for uh, Filecoin, so we want to look into uh, how that is performing. Uh, we, as I mentioned yesterday, many of the tools that we're building are already, of course, open source and documented and everything but we want to kind of group everything into what we call that continuous measurement infrastructure uh, and try to have, you know, uh, the tools running, uh, having some data warehousing and then analyzing the data to make them mu much more easy to consume by all of you, but also, you know, the ecosystem and other users. So that's another area we want to uh, work on. Uh, and area three is uh, the lib P2P privacy guarantees that I mentioned yesterday. We already have uh, an ongo a project ongoing with uh, Chainsafe. We're, in, like, we're implementing, and it's almost you know, uh, complete from that respect, uh, something called double hashing approach for IPFS, uh, which provides reader privacy. Uh, but as you know, with privacy, there is kind of no one size fits all, and the community has been very vocal about several other um, kind of techniques that can go um, to improve privacy in lib um, So, uh, yeah, we want to, at the first place, uh, go talk to the community, investigate what other techniques are available and are worth uh, looking into more in detail. Uh, yeah, so that's it from me. Thank you. And the next one is... Yeah, first thing the lib P2P team will be working on is uh, connectivity, um, especially to bring the browsers closer to the uh, lib P2P ecosystem. Um, we already talked about the web transport transport yesterday. Um, it works, but 
we, now we can use it. We need to use it to enable new use cases. For example, we can upload, fi uh, upload files from the browser directly to the Falcon network. That's the kind of, of things that are possible now that, um, that browsers can connect. Um, we'll also uh, continue our work on WebRTC, making sure that browsers can also connect to, to a Rustly P2P nodes. And later on, we'll also have browser-to-browser -browser connectivity um, so that any browser on the LIP2P network can connect to any other browser, um, including hole punching, without any configuration needed. We'll be also focusing on interoperability. Um, LIP2P is the foundation for a lot of uh, multi-billion dollar networks, and we really need to make sure that, that this is a rock-solid uh, foundation and uh, that we don't um, accidentally break, break backwards compatibility. So we'll, we'll, in, we'll invest into having a, a, a testing framework that makes sure that, that lip 2 p um, is, is that reliable. Um, and our last point on, on this slide is we will focus on, on performance. Uh, and performance has um, two, two, two things. Uh, first thing is uh, the connection establishment. Um, currently, lip 2 p is not as fast as it could be a lot of our transports are not as fast as they could be establishing a new connection, um, which hurts the time to first byte metrics. We'll make sure that we are not wasting any round trips anymore and really have, have very fast handshakes. Um, we'll also add support for uh, better and faster transports, like the uh, quick work that's currently happening in, in Rust lib 2 p And then the other part of performance is um, throughput. We want to make sure that lip 2 p is on par with HTTP. We already have me measurements that show that lip 2 p is, is as fast, but we want to have a dashboard and we want to have um, continuous measurements uh, to make sure that we don't regress on that. Question? Hey, Martin, quick question. Yeah. For WebRTC browser to browser, do yes. you guys have any plans for running the stock and or turn service for that or using other kind of um, that's something we still need to figure out. If you're interested in more detailed roadmaps, um, we have them all living uh, within the different implementations of, of uh, uh, lib 2 p So just head to the golib 2 p rust lib 2 p js lib 2 p repository to learn more there. This one. Hello, everyone. Uh, so I'm going to talk about IPFS and JS and what uh, the, the plan is for the next year or so. Um, so uh, something that seems to happen often is people are like, oh, is there somebody working on JS IPFS? Um, yes. Hi, that's me. Uh, so we need to do, clearly do a better job of communicating the state of uh, IPFS and JS, um, which includes, uh, yeah, so doing blog posts, I'm doing a talk at IPFS camp, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and just popularizing it, and which will hopefully help with recruitment, which is definitely something that needs to happen. So obviously the team right now is incredibly under-resourced. Um, so we definitely want to double the team capacity at least. Um, please see me after class if you would like to, to help out. Um, yes. Uh, and then the, the, big, uh, the, big, the big piece of work is obviously so Go IPFS renamed to Cubo, um, and we want to make space for other implementations. Um, so JS IPFS will be renaming to, to Pomegranate. Um, it's a, that is a, it's a, it's a placeholder name. Obviously, it's not available on NPM, so we can't actually use this one. Um, but there will be some community voting on, on names and that kind of thing. And the idea is basically, instead of having uh, this <clears throat> enormous monolithic API that's basically been copied from, from Go IPFS, it's more to, to try and double down on, on uh, kind of the model that the, like the Web3 storage folks have, have taken, where you're you kind of you're using like individual components of uh, of kind of the IPFS stack to, to make a very custom version uh, that will suit your particular use case. So if you don't need IPNS, don't configure IPNS. You don't you don't need to have the extra dependencies and, and all that kind of stuff. If you don't need you know like all these esoteric hashing functions, you don't don't use them. Um, and just really let people make small lightweight implementations. 
that just speak to very specific use cases. And then Pomegranate itself would be like a, you know, a, like a toolkit for you to build this kind of thing with some sensible defaults that, that let you kind of get started quickly. Um, yeah, so the, we want to have, uh, yeah, so V1 released in Q1 of 2023 uh, with the full like CI pipeline and, and uh, network connectivity built, built on all the, the work that uh, Martin just described in, lib, in, in JS lib P2P. So definitely taking the web first approach. So using uh, transports that let you dial uh, Kubo nodes and uh, Rust lib P2P nodes directly from the browser. Um, and we will then, when, when there's a, a minimum level of functionality, we will then sunset uh, JS IPFS itself. That's it. Thank you. Hi, everyone. So, uh, quick announcement. We just discovered our team name yesterday. Uh, it's IPFS GUI and Tools, which turned into IGNT, which turns into Ignite. So, um, uh, <laughs> So uh, we, we kind of just brainstormed this roadmap, which maps to, you know, the 2023 strategy, uh, you know, the, the placemats that are everywhere and that we should all know by heart now, right? So um, this is this, you know, I'll go into detail in a second. And there are some dates that we have in Notion that aren't in these slides, unfortunately. Sorry about that. But uh, our, our number one priority is to increase developer velocity and decrease onboarding friction. Uh, right now, we have a lot of technical debt that, that just makes things really difficult. So that, that requires paying off tech debt from the, there being a lack of a you know, GUI team for the past two years, um, increasing our, our internal developer velocity, um, and uh, updating to the latest IPFS ecosystem with all the updates that Alex has been making lately and then we don't know what x is right now but we want to increase the adoption and usage of our products ipfs desktop and web ui so part of figuring out what that x is is developing and implementing a ux strategy so defining some metrics that that tell us what success means how to figure that out what our user stories are user personas and things like that um UI refresh for some of our items, uh, some of our products where, um, talk about that here in a second on the next slide. And then there's sort of a, I'll, I'll skip over this one, but you know, a dream goal, which probably won't happen in 2023, but of like doing a distributed web three hosted version of web components instead of like a centralized server. But, um, yeah, talk to us if you're interested in that. Um, but some more specific details on our products for IPFS companion, there's a important call out that, you know, Chrome has manifest V3, which I'm not the expert on. So I'll have to point you to another direction, but let me know if you have questions. Uh, we do have some work that's important that needs to be done before June, 2023. Um, and there's some cleanup in IPFS companion that we're going to be working on. Um, uh, updating the UI, we have some mocks in place on some GitHub issues. And then uh, for desktop and web UI, we're, we're removing, uh, you know, it's already pretty tightly coupled with Kubo, like Kubo is the implementation that we use for desktop and web UI. But there's still some um, artifacts that exist from JS IPFS and other libraries and packages we use that we need to pull out. So we'll be focusing on a lot of that. There's actually an issue open right now, which is a partial blocker for enabling web transport, web transport by default in Kubo. Um, so there's an issue for that. I, I think I have it fixed now, Jeropo. Bet me that it wouldn't be fixed today, but we'll see. Um, and then uh, doing, doing some diagnostic tooling overhaul and then public gateway checker, we're not, you know, that's not a priority, but there's a, a lot of activity that's happened with public gateways over the past year. And I think that's an important uh, piece of the community that we can really benefit from putting a little bit of effort into. So that's our plan. Loaders and actors uh, in 2023. So again, we are still trying to not keep 
uh, you know, keep the network running, not kill the network. If there's an incident, we got to fix it. That's our top priority. We also want to grow in the team. Uh, Lotus team does have the domain expertise on Falcon in a lot of sense. So we want to help onboarding maybe engineers, maybe technical support engineers, onboarding them and ship them, uh, ship them to other teams uh, to support other efforts. Also, we are breaking down the team to three different engine engineering tracks. The first one is like driving research to production, basically writing FIPS, ship FIPS, ship network upgrades. Uh, it's very important uh, that for each network upgrade, we want to have a very fun code name, a meme, so we can have all those balloons. So that's our top priority, as I, I think. And the next thing is, uh, Lotus was first like created, uh, it was like a prototype of like show showcase Falcon as a concept works. So there's a lot of different component in the Lotus, Lotus code base today. However, as a client implementation, we don't really know who is our defined user because everyone was forced to use Lotus. However, now we have Forest, we have Venus, we have other implementation in the uh, network. We want to make sure we, we know like what Lotus is as a client implementation, who is our users, what's our use cases, and we want to simplify, clean, clean up the code base and define, deliver specific um, usage to different uh, stakeholders of the network. And uh, last but not least, manners. We want to keep the storage provider happy. Also, we want to make sure our storage onboarding can be robust enough so we can, uh, the Lotus miner, uh, the sealer onboarding can handle all the data coming from Boost. And that's why we want to modular Lotus Miner and do some real architecture and to enable e easy deployment for large scale enterprise uh, level storage provider. Uh, why, why capitalize there is like, uh, we do care more about data onboarding uh, storage provider as a software. So we want to make sure the solution can handle the incoming data instead of just like, you know, CC sectors. Um, so that being said, our milestone, again, the don't mind the dates, it's very placeholder. We don't know what we are talking about in general, uh, but like in 2023, uh, we want to ship a couple of network upgrades, the ones that we have in mind. It's just like a high level theme. Uh, first, we're gonna ship a shark, uh, then we will enable FAM. Uh, actually, it's, yeah, it's February, yes, so it's Q1, right? We want to do the FAM upgrade uh, to the network, so then we want to set up the user programmable storage market by enable some public API in the actors or and refactor the uh, built-in actors so that other people can deploy user contracts and interacting with that. And then we want to um, deploy more like enhanced features to make uh, community members can deploy interesting storage market, for example, using Halo to prove a better user cron and much more things. Um, we have to go down the path exploring who is our users for the Lotus client implementation. But so far, uh, a couple of things has been defined. Yes, we want to make sure the node operators can deploy a node easily uh, from snapshot and starting up the daemon can manage the um, chain like state. Uh, we want to help deploy a Filecoin client API uh, standard. So like different node application can talk to the uh, client implementation easily and maybe explore to a light client uh, solution uh, so that people can just build apps and talking to Falco chain in a web browser and things like that. And the last one, we are gonna do modular Lotus Miner. It's gonna be a huge effort. We're gonna take input from Boost team as well. Uh, but in general, we want to enable flexible scheduler, uh, standard load ceiling manager, manager uh, process and we also want to make sure uh, as we scale people can still prove their uh, storage uh, through like redundant proving system uh, and I think maybe there are gonna be some updatable storage in the roadmap uh, in collaboration with crypto net lab so we will see if that happens um, but that's it for now uh, for the Lotus and actor team Filecoin Infra 2023 Priorities First objective, Filecoin core infrastructure will continue to scale and decentralize. Lotus Lightweight Chain Snapshot is a, another chain snapshot service that the Filecoin Infra team has started to run, and the official launch will be alongside the Lotus Shark upgrade happening at the beginning of November. The second milestone, Snapshot Artifact 
storage decentralization and redundancy will occur in Q2 of 2023 to ensure that there is always high availability for the snapshots that are critical for new Lotus nodes to join the network in a expedient amount of time. The next area, Lotus Bootstrap Node and Disputer Decentralization. Our milestone is to develop impact evaluators and service level expectations in Q1 of 2023. We are hoping to get more organizations within the PLN to run bootstrap nodes and disputers and to track the service levels and uptime of the of those uh, nodes that are part of the official Lotus binary bootstrap list. For the Lotus Gateway, API chain.love, we have a milestone around improved horizontal scaling and a website launch. The website is already launched and most of our Horizontal scaling design has been deployed with the remaining item being to ensure that our multi-region setup is operating correctly. For the Lotus Build Artifact Pipeline, we have a milestone around Lotus Build Artifact Dashboard and Reporting, and that is also happening right now. We have our first prototype of a dashboard available in the Protocol Labs Grafana Cloud account. You can check it out. Um, and our second milestone in that area is a Lotus release pipeline re-architecture with validation and further observability uh, aimed for Q1 of 2023. For um, our second objective, it's our Web3 GitOps platform will accelerate application productionization. Our first milestone is around general uh, availability launching sometime in Q1 of 2023. And finally, our third objective is that the next generation of Lotus DevNets will lower the bar of entry for creating new DevNets in the Falcon network. And the first milestone, DevNet deployment automation and tooling for CI integration and easy DevNet creation, targeting Q2 of 2023. Um, we're hoping that we can make the process of creating new DevNets so easy that we can spin them up as part of CI, and likewise, it'll be so easy for other people within the PLN to uh, launch a new DevNet and further further accelerate um, the uh, protocol and application development within the Filecoin network. That's all. Thank you. All right, so um, for 20, 2023 priority for Sentinel team, uh, we, it's mainly in three main areas, uh, Lili, PLD, WN community. So I got feedback that I should explain what Lili is. Uh, so it's basically a Filecoin chain indexer. Um, and the two important milestones for Lili, uh, first one is for it to be ready for FVM adoption in Lotus and Filecoin. Um, it's a, always an ongoing effort. Um, and the second, it, um, we have a um, major change in Lily to extract chain state as the IPOD object uh, to serve as the IDO for consumers. Um, we got feedback from our um, users that Lily is sometimes not very flexible uh, or it's not customi customizable. So we want to provide this feature in order to achieve um, those, uh, those requests. And for TODW, uh, which stands for Protocol Lab Data Warehouse, um, so we want to provide a full blockchain data available in BigQuery by the end of uh, Q4. And we will start to include all the off-chain data in BigQuery as well um, in um, early Q1. And um, we also want to achieve Filecoin data validation and data quality checks in our warehouse, um, probably in Q Q2 next year. And for the community, we want to uh, collaborate with our important partners like Starboard, um, to run and improve our Sentinel and Lily nodes and to collect feedback and to have more public appearance. For example, we are going to have a speaking um, um, file, Phil, um, Phil Lisbon next week um, to talk about uh, Sentinel software and the, and the data, data set we're going to uh, make it public in BigQuery going forward. 
and to see if um, um, it will bring more value to our community and to bring more awesome stuff that we'll build on top of our uh, service and data. And um, yeah, that's it. Thank you. So for Crypto Econ Lab, we've recently split into three groups. So we have one for ecosystem, one for layer two incentives, and one for core protocol. Um, and it's the core protocol working group I'm going to tell you a little bit about here. So this is related to critical stewardship of the network. And essentially, it's anything related to incentives uh, for, for the the core protocol of Filecoin. So concretely things like onboarding, but more generally, how do we understand and keep aligned uh, the, the growth um, of the network along the directions that we want? Um, so the objectives that we're looking at here, um, I can tell you about the first objective. The first objective is to prepare the gas economy for scalability and feature upgrades. So what does this mean? Scalability, we're effectively talking about IPC. And here there's very difficult questions over what the economy should look like in terms of uh, in terms of gas and in terms of collateral. Uh, so this is something that's critical for the network to look at. Um, in terms of feature upgrades, effectively this refers to uh, Filecoin virtual machine. So potentially uh, the, the gas landscape in the future could be very dif uh, different and this could change quite quickly. So this is something we really need to be on top of in terms of developing the tools to monitor and simulate what this gas look uh, gas um, might look like in the near future, as well as developing ideas to be able to deal with a, a network that might have much um, higher high, higher levels of um, congestion and activity quite soon. Um, Another objective is to sustain the health of Filecoin's economy and issue uh, and escalate issues early. Um, so there's two parts to this. Um, on one is to do with monitoring and detecting icebergs early. Um, and another part is to do uh, with a systematic review of essentially all uh, aspects of the core protocol that we're looking at. So this is things like termination fees, things like uh, locking, uh, things like minting. So there's a, there's a lot of work uh, to do here and um, a, a, a lot of these things could be changing uh, or being updated or at least opening discussions in public um, Q4, Q1 next year. Another thing we're looking at is to develop, another objective is to develop uh, capacity and to power new research and quickly form views on economic policies. So in terms of developing capacity, there's now three people in the core, uh, core group, and we have about five people who are partially contributing, and we're trying to ha uh, hire engineers. So this gives us a lot more capacity to engage um, on basically almost all FIPS, I hope, um, because many things t touch on economics. Um, so that's something we're looking to do, as well as to publish a lot more research and hold seminars, um, open source the codes and methods that we're using. Uh, so those are the, the objectives for, uh, for 2023 and that we want to focus on in terms of milestones uh, for the next few months. Uh, one big milestone is likely to be rebasing uh, minting uh, to make it depend on QAP. Uh, another milestone that uh, we hope to release soon uh, is to give some concrete details and make this public on a spec for what economic elements of ICP might look like. So this is uh, relating to gas and collateral. And then a third milestone is to propose an upgrade of, uh, or at least open the discussion uh, for how we might upgrade uh, Filecoin's gas model to better support uh, FEM coming along next year. Uh, th thank you. Um, so on the Deeran front, we want, uh, there are again three areas, uh, distinct areas that we're going to focus on. The first one is refactor um, very central parts of the code base so that we are enabled to um, land on mainnet things that we have been developing and are actively developing right now. Uh, one of them is time block encryption that Jolan talked about yesterday and you've heard a lot um, in demo days and other events. Uh, another one is that we want to refactor the most central part of the sharing ceremony in DRAN, which is the DKG. Um, a, lot, a lot depends on that, and if we want to move to a stage where 
we're going to be able to expand the League of Entropy and have more members. Uh, we need to have what is called async ceremonies, where things uh, run, we're a little bit more flexible with how we run things. Uh, and certainly a few things need to change there. Um, so um, maintenance and active development of, of new features is uh, area number one. Area number two, we think uh, Dirond is a great service, uh, provides great value, and we want to drive community engagement. We want to have more clients, more users, of course, more LOE members as well. Uh, but primarily what this area is focusing on is um, make it easier for developers to go and use Dirond in their own application. Uh, so uh, we're seeing lots of new members coming in um, to our Dirond Slack workspace. And that's thanks to great um, public talks that the team has been doing the last couple of quarters. But we do want to have um, things like hackathons, things like how-to guides, updated docs, um, a proto school tutorial, at least one, um, so that it's easier uh, for others to onboard. Uh, and finally, uh, engagement, further engagement with the League of Entropy. Uh, this is a group of 16 partner organizations and growing. Um, right now, um, yeah, there is some engagement, there is some cross-collaboration, but there isn't too much of like collaborative development for Dirand. Uh, if there was a way, you know, with 16 partners, you know, if uh, every one of them did a tiny bit, then we would see massive progress and we would be able to do a lot more. Uh, so we want to build on that. Um, incentives for LOE partners is something that has been discussed over the years again and again. And uh, yeah, we think it's time to do it now. Uh, so yeah, that's it. Ducks. <laughs> uh, so other than supporting the engineer, uh, engineering projects like effort, like creating contents as needed for the end user, these are the like docs projects in general, what we are going to be doing. First, we are trying to looking for a localization solution for all the doc sites for the major projects of the uh, PL stack. Uh, now we have matrix. Uh, we know in which region we have the most uh, visitors of our doc site. We want to help them to understand uh, our stack and building on top of the uh, on building on top of the technology we're building. The next one, we want to organize and improve the UI and UX of the doc site so that like user can find the content easily and also knowing where to, like, uh, uh, and can, can have a deployment flow to actually build an application using our end user docs. Um, also, we know that Falcoin wants to have a real architecture kind of because now we ha we have like FEM introducing a lot of like developers into the network. So we want to make sure we have a section for that. For lib P2P, everyone is saying we basically have to re re recreate the docs uh, so that like it actually uh, presents uh, all the progress that uh, the lib P2P project has moving forward and also IPFS team. I just heard that the team might want to focus on enable uh, more developers to actually building the to building the implementation along with building the applications. So some refactor will be needed on the docs uh, for that effort. And the next one, we want to enable robust and OSS contributions because uh, we cannot do the education by ourselves. We only have three people over there, uh, so we want to make sure that there's uh, people who understand our like docs structure can create APRs directly to the docs and uh, uh, enable more people to educate uh, other folks to contribute into the stack. Uh, we In Q4, we want to slowly initiate the uh, docs as a service. Uh, so basically what we are looking for, like maybe, just like maybe, we can have applications, yes, like modularized and have uh, uh, people can just, you know, as the, uh, for any like PL uh, new projects, if they have any doc site needs, they can move things around, click a button, and just spin up a doc site. Because uh, as we moving from like driving protocol to productization, we think a lot of team, team will be creating new product that will need uh, new docs, and we cannot like just like you know have docs engineer for each product. So we are gonna try to make this a self service like. Um, platform to do that. Uh, it's the high hope uh, for Doc's team for the next year, uh, but we hope we can get there. Uh, 
Awesome. That brings us through all our critical system stewardship. A lot of stuff in there, but all really, really, really good, really important. Um, moving on to growing the team and network. Anyone who's presenting in this section, please come up on deck. Um, I can do the first one, which is from Uni, um, who leads our kind of like Starfleet events team, which is just one of many events teams in the PL network. Um, they have some focus on end res specific events, events that are specifically targeting how um, we can help, you know, catalyze amazing, amazing conversations and uh, growth and development in these ecosystems. Um, so first, partnering with the PL network events team. I think this is uh, like teams across the entire network to solidify a 2024 events calendar um, and do a lot of cross knowledge sharing about, you know, how of all the events that we've run this past year um, and the years before that, what has worked best and make sure that we level up kind of cohesive knowledge um, across this like really quickly growing team. Um, so the items within that is getting a 2024 events calendar by the end of November, um, which would be amazing. We could all actually plan our, our schedules for next year um, and then have a playbook and tips for event planning. The next one is continuing to plan IPFS and other Starfleet uh, kind of like sponsored events, ones where we put a lot of time into the content curation, specifically IPFS thing and IPFS camp for next year. Um, and so I think the, uh, the goals are to increase attendance on both IPFS thing from 90 attendees to 300, IPFS camp from 450 to 1,000, um, which will be amazing. I think those are totally doable. Um, on that same vein, growing the IPFS community, um, creating a way in which we can help regional area hosts um, own more IPFS community events. Um, this is probably additive to the um, you know, ecosystem orbit programs, uh, but maybe focused uh, a little bit more on like disseminating um, knowledge and best practices, um, and also to, to host uh, IPFS and friends pop-ups and dinners around these major major events across other ecosystems um, so that we can have kind of more uh, seamless cross collaboration with the many many different ecosystems that all build on on IPFS so they want to launch three regions for IPFS community events and for IPFS and friends pop-ups if you have ideas on which places we should really really be present for IPFS please reach out to uni and we can help prioritize that um, uh, amazing one, care about the world. Um, that sounds great. Uh, promote less waste in our event hosting process. Be, be green. Okay, that's the, that's the TLDR. We all care about the world. Um, but also making sure that we're supporting local communities when we host our events um, so that there's lots of engagement and, um, and collaboration in the regions where we go and bring these events to. Um, so finding more partner organizations, donating a good amount of the supplies so that we don't end up with lots of waste at the end of um, events or dinners, um, and especially food food related, making sure those all go to a good place um, and you know feed people who who are hungry uh, at the end of a, a great event. Um, and finally, communicate. Um, uh, great events are definitely important when we get people in person, but they're also important after the fact to harness and disseminate all of uh, the knowledge and decisions and actions that got committed to in that period of time for everyone who wasn't able to make it. Um, and so leaning into newsletters and other ways of sharing the output of events so that people can, uh, um, can build upon that. So that's events. And more group three, yeah. Cool. So I'm going to talk about the uh, ecosystem working group. That's this, the the rightmost, leftmost sub team of the uh, Crypto Econ Lab. So e the ecosystem solutions group, we're kind of this input output layer uh, to the core protocol and the layer two groups uh, to do communication and education uh, type functions uh, from all the good research and findings that are going on in the other two groups. So our main objectives are we. We want to establish uh, Crypto Econ Lab as a defining global leader in crypto economics and kind of be the center of excellence. Um, uh, another objective is to increase broadly the, the PLN's understanding of crypto economics. So similar to what Yolan was talking about with you know security kind of going out and you know permeating in the network, we want everyone to be thinking like an economist. So we want to be producing uh, you know work that that indicates that and have resources and things like that. Um, uh, a third item uh, of our objectives is to ensure that Filecoin governance has effective mechanisms in crypto economics because 
A lot of times uh, when a FIP or proposal is cryptoeconomic, it has decision making, it has trade offs, it has a lot of these things that are uh, kind of core economic right in the wheelhouse there. And so uh, we want to kind of apply some research and rigor to our processes and in, in governance. So looking out over the next six months, uh, some of the key milestones that we would have uh, associated with those objectives are our Crypto Econ Day events. So we're trying to kind of put a stake in the ground and have these quarterly. So we'd love like if you also have uh, events that you want to kind of co-host and, and have in, in the same locations. You know, we do a lot of that with, you know, the, the Phil events like Phil Singapore and Phil Lisbon. Uh, but we want to kind of kind of be a stake in the ground for that as well. Uh, we want that to be a, a hub where people come uh, from, you know, all kinds of chains and, and projects in Web3, not just the PLN and, and kind of be a knowledge sharing hub for that. Uh, another milestone is that uh, we want to start delivering educational workshops uh, towards the goals that I was mentioning earlier. We want to make, make workshops uh, to make uh, crypto economic concepts and tools and templates accessible to, to everybody in the PLN. Uh, we want to mature our publication channels for the content that the other two sub teams are, are producing. Uh, so publishing more academic papers, publishing blog posts, and just getting the, the knowledge out there. Uh, and then we also want to uh, specifically publish a, a state of knowledge report on economic governance across Web3 to kind of inform our own governance activities. So, thank you. Hello, uh, yeah, IPDX again. So, uh, as you probably heard a lot already, uh, TestGround is one of the projects that seems to be quite important in our network. <laughs> so, that's certainly our main focus and you know, it's actually using all of our resources at the moment. <laughs> uh, and we want it to become the distributed and decentralized system testing platform. And for that to happen, we think that first, uh, we have to reconcentrate on usability of TestGround. That we want it to be delightful to use because otherwise we just won't get users. Uh, we put a number up there, but that's really made up and we are going to think about it more. But we, we, we think that by concentrating on usability, we can grow the number of users of this ground. Uh, then the second goal uh, would be to uh, allow mm, creating large scale test plans uh, that scale beyond what a single machine can do. And we want to do that by reviving the test ground as a service effort. Uh, and for that, we want to be able to run millions of test plans, uh, which is currently not possible. Uh, and finally, uh, we want to meet all the needs uh, that, that LeapP2P might need, uh, because we think through that we'll support other teams that build on top of LeapP2P, and it, would, it will allow us to cover a wide variety of different test cases that we want, want, might want to, to test for. Uh, but for all of that to even be feasible, <laughs> uh, we, we need test run to be stable. Uh, we need to, to come up with uh, project management techniques that, that will allow us to, to track that and to, to make sure uh, we move forward into the right direction. So that's, that's another angle of our work uh, or the next year. Uh, but that's not the only thing we're working on. We also want to work with you either certainly so many uh, opportunities for, for collaboration with DevRel, UX, security, Net NetOps. Uh, we want to talk with you constant, continuously. We want to know what's happening. We want to be able to help. Uh, and we also want to highlight that, that we want to stay heavily user-focused. Uh, so one of the ideas we have for next year that we hope hiring might allow us to do is to embed ourselves within every single team within IP stewards so that we better understand very specific team needs. Uh, but we also want to scale the learnings beyond IP stewards. Uh, so that's what we mean by working together in the entire network. Uh, and finally, like we don't forget about the things we already developed. We do focus on maintenance as well. So for next year, we also do plan uh, two major unified CI releases. Uh, Probably a lot more as well, but it didn't fit into the slide. Uh, 
If you want to learn more about our specific plans, we do have everything public on our Notion page. Uh, the Notion page covers the general IPDX direction uh, that we want to move into. Uh, and we also have a very specific project roadmap for, for test grant that's hosted in GitHub uh, in the test grant project. Uh, thank you. Awesome. On to storage and retrieval. Um, everyone who's in the storage and retrieval group, please come up. Um, this is focused on making sure that we can onboard lots of awesome user data, make it accessible, and make it accessible across many different places, and, and uh, really focus on the speed of retrieving that content as well. Um, starting with Bedrock. Jacob. Hello. All right. So, priorities for 2023. So Bedrock is kind of considering ourselves a, a team of platform teams. We're kind of focused on three main working groups. Um, and so one of the big ones is pairing up retrieval protocols in Boost to get reliable and performant retrievals. And so big goals for us, and you can check out the roadmap in Notion. We've got a full thing through the first half of next year. Um, and so a lot of the work that we're going to be doing there is working very closely with the Saturn team to unlock as Saturn starts to fall back to retrieve directly from SPs. We want that to work really, really well. Um, so we're gonna be doing a lot of work to scale that up, doing a lot of performance testing there. And then on indexing side, we want to compete with Web2 in terms of data discovery. We want you to be able to find content fast. So whether it's IPFS or Filecoin, we want you to, to, to get it quickly. And then on the boost side of things, working closely with the Lotus team on scaling data onboarding. How can we improve that throughput? Some of the ballpark numbers we're thinking about right now is how can we get to a petabyte of ability for a single SP to be able to ingest per day? Um, and then, so some things we're asking ourselves of, of constantly, constant questions of how can we enable more compelling stories uh, of data storage on Filecoin? And so this is us thinking about how are we working with our product managers on Bedrock to reach out to more communities understand use cases so that we can make sure that all of the fundamentals there are working really, really well. And so also a lot of things that we're thinking about now is who are the people that we need to be working with, right? We need to work with the network growth team to talk, out, talk about SPs and clients. We need to work with retrieval markets on to serve content, to unlock Saturn uh, in the future. And then we're also gonna be working with compute over data to make sure that all of their use cases going forward that they have the storage and retrieval needs that, that they need uh, to meet. We're also gonna be having a retrieval incentive discussion tomorrow at the Retrieval Market Summit. And so that's also gonna unlock a roadmap for the first half of next year on what do incentives look like in the network, reputation systems, et cetera, to make sure that SPs also have what they need to serve retrievals. Yay. Okay, Retrieval Markets Working Group. Uh, so yeah, we've been hearing a lot about Saturn and Station over the last couple of days, but two teams does not a working group make. So there's loads more teams out there who are working on stuff in this space. Um, and this leads into number two, growing team and network. We're gonna continue to grow the working group and just communicate the progress better with more demo days, uh, more meetings, more events. The really big thing that we're trying to achieve with retrieval markets is just deploying retrieval networks. So Statin is the one which is being built by the Retrieval Markets Lab at Protocol Labs, but there are other teams out there uh, like Meson as well as Titan and a few other teams that are building retrieval networks as well, or DCDNs. And so just like we've heard yesterday, it's good to have a few different teams working on these same sort of problems, and then they might start to specialize in different directions, perhaps optimizing for video or metaverse or, or other sort of retrieval journeys. Um, crypto economic incentives. There's so many question marks around this space. As, J as Jake mentioned, we've got this retrieval incentives summit uh, workshop tomorrow at the retrieval markets summit. Uh, and that's going to be focusing on the retrievals from storage providers. But there's also the incentives to make retrieval providers join these networks. And there's so many ideas that we can explore. And as part of the Retrieval Markets Lab and also in the Retrieval Markets Working Group, we want to explore some of those ideas to improve the concepts and just see where that, that takes us. And I think FVM is going to unlock a lot of possibilities for us in that space. 
There's also, we've heard about all these data transfer protocol uh, improvements of web transport, transport, um, and yeah, WebRTC, some of the stuff the Bedrock team's working on, BitSwap, GraphSync, and how we can maybe do parallel uh, or multi-peer retrievals. So looking into those as a working group is gonna be really important, and that will feed back into uh, the Saturn projects and other DCDNs. Um, yeah, and we're now gonna hear from, from Saturn and Station as well. All right, thank you, Patrick, ultimate hype man. I'm Onsgar with the Saturn Project, and let's catch you up to speed on all the progress you've been making in going into 2023. So tomorrow is a big day. Tomorrow we launch. So what we've been working on for a while, that team, those beautiful people on that table over there, what we've been working on for the last six months sees the light of day. And so going into 2023, the first goal is to grow Saturn to about 200 nodes worldwide. So what L1 nodes are, these are big beefy nodes in data centers. And to put that in perspective, 200 nodes puts us in the same realm of performance CDNs like Cloudflare, Amazon CloudFront, et cetera. That's about how many points of presence they have worldwide. So that is goal numero uno. There's a second piece to Saturn's network though, and that is L2s. And the L2s are smaller nodes that run on machines like this. So as you'll hear from the ever capable Miro in a second, we're building a desktop app called Station that anyone can download around the world. And the first component in that desktop app will be a piece of Saturn's CDN. And that's what we're calling an L2. So another goal for Saturn come 2023 is to engender and get the L2 network off the ground. So that means getting lots of people all around the world to install Saturn through Station on their machines and start contributing to the network. Now, the third piece here, as Jacob mentioned before, the third goal of Saturn is to accelerate IPFS gateway traffic. So we have a huge corpus of requests that land at the IPFS gateway every single day and every single month, and it's fantastic to see that growth. And what we want to do is leverage Saturn's large and growing network to speed that traffic up. So not just onboard new users, new customers to Filecoin Saturn, but take that existing corpus of traffic and accelerate that for everyone worldwide. And another key piece of this is also to try and drive down the infrastructure cost so that we can lean into the crypto economics of building our own network with Saturn and replace the IFS gateway centralized infrastructure with Saturn's. And then the final piece and the final goal for 2023 and our little band of misfits at Team Saturn is to onboard our first customers. So Saturn at large wants to be a paid for service at scale at world-class best performance. And to do that, we want to bring on customers where that is valuable to them and they will pay for that. And so in the beginning, we're bootstrapping the network with a pot of Filecoin to get nodes online and grow our network footprint. But over time, we want customers to come and pay. And then the amount of, that we'll be paying out in Filecoin, for example, running L1s and running L2s, will be paid for not just by customers, but then like customer and, customer and growing customer demand beyond that. So those are our four goals going into 2023. And next up, Miro. Thank you, guys. Ah, hello. I'll keep it short because you are all tired by now. For Station, we have three priorities for the next year. The first one is more short term, and that's to launch it. We expect to launch it in the middle of the year, starting with a beta in March, then iron out all the details and then do a big public launch with a party, I hope. Then the more medium term goal is to add another module to station. We are talking with the Bacalao team. So ideally by the end of the year, you would, be, you would have a Bacalao node running in your station, even, earning you even more Filecoin. All good. And then for longer term, we are researching a custom runtime that will make it easier for people to build their modules. And the runtime will take care of things like sandboxing the code, making sure it's, the modules are not using too much resources and other concerns we have around security and uh, usability of station. So that's it. Thank you. If anyway, I would have brought my entire team on stage. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, storage products. Uh, Cryptonet focuses on three different uh, uh, items, uh, research protocol and products. And now we're going to see a little bit of protocols and products for uh, creating more, um, uh, for growing the network, for uh, more for robust and resilient storage. 
So we have a lot of FIPs coming up. Uh, they are about, um, with a whole uh, line, I'm just gonna mention a few milestones. There will be a more programmable storage, the power security FIP, resnapping that allows for storing uh, into not only CC sectors, and then there is a sub technology, or that is the name for the on-chain inclusion proof for sub, for sub deals. And uh, so this is for the Falcon storage protocol, but then for, we have a lot of storage protocols that we would like to work on. One in particular that was mentioned multiple times th today is the data persistence. It's a twist on the availability that, that allows for Filecoin to allow uh, long-term storage of chain data. We have uh, multiple steps there, starting from requirement, requirement gathering uh, down to uh, writing a protocol for pooling storage resources for miners. Today, miners act as individuals. It would be great if we could be act as a pool. Um, and then for uh, storing in this pool chain data from Filecoin, the checkpoints at some point, Ethereum, and so on. Um, and the goal is to get uh, this ready by next year. Uh, then, very briefly, yesterday I gave a quick demo on this uh, data wallet. We're still working on this. We have a lot of on-chain storage products, whether it's retrieval, whether it's products that other people will build on top of FEM, and we still want to, uh, we, we have the dashboard live as of uh, the beginning of lab week uh, on onchain.storage or retrieve.org. They are two different apps. And the goal is to uh, ship the dashboard at the end of the year, and as soon as we're gonna have more apps being built on FEM, we will, the plan is to integrate, to integrate them. We're also planning to build new storage products, such as uh, crowdfunding of storage or perpetual storage, which is uh, items that a lot of people have been asking for. Uh, this doesn't handle payments. Uh, after audits and so on, uh, we will be enable payments on this. Thank you. Okay, this is for Bifrost. Um, very simple, three steps. Make sure we're still running very well. Second, make it better. So it's um, open source out, so the community can run the Bifrost as, as, as thing as quality as us, so improve our quality. So the key milestone we will have first try to make sure we have a zero downtime, so anything upgrade from the COBOL point of view. Second is um, have a integrate with the center network to lower our TTF, the first bit deliver. Uh, third thing is to provide a new service. So we have, have bad bit, um, the nice service for the world to use. So around some of the best CID not get serving from us. The last one is more on how to we be able to share our knowledge, how to run our by force and allow the community to be part of it. Thank you. Sorry. <clears throat> Hello. Uh, in terms of objectives for Daghouse next year, it's, I guess, been a year since nucleation was, as a concept, was born, along with, like, the meme and the drinking game and everything. Um, and we've been working towards it. Um, last year was about getting stability and reliability and performance. Uh, this next year, we're still working towards that, but more from a differentiation and growth angle. Uh, so we want to grow a ton, uh, targeting 10% weekly user growth um, since uh, pricing was introduced with our product and then actually do the nucleation thing. Uh, and there's a lot that goes into landing that plane because there are internal dependencies with folks like uh, Outer Core and NFT storage, as well as proving to external investors that we are a product worth investing in. Uh, some of the key milestones involved in this, uh, we are uh, finishing up uh, our end-to-end -end fast read story on Web3 storage, uh, along with some cost optimizations there, uh, should land by this year. We're rolling out our UCAN-based uh, upload API uh, into the core Web3 storage and NFT storage products, as well as implementing UCAN-based APIs across the board. Uh, we'll be implementing metrics so we can better track what we need to inform our efforts. Uh, nucleation is like the next big milestone. There might be some stuff in between that we meet, might need to do depending on user feedback and how things are going. Um, and then down the road, we also want to offer our users consumption-based pricing and really give them the option to uh, utilize the cheap Filecoin storage, uh, where today's experience is they have to store in the places we tell them to tomorrow. Um, with Filecoin at the forefront, we think we can disrupt storage pricing. Thanks. Uh, 
FYI, 10% week over week growth is going to have you grow 140x next year, which would be friggin' awesome. So make it happen. Hello, my name is Raul, and I'm going to give you a roadmap update on the Falcon Virtual Machine project. We are currently focused on completing and stabilizing EBM compatibility on the FBM. By early December, we will be transitioning the Wallaby Bleeding Edge testnet into a stable developer testnet, which, we, which we're calling Buildernet. We will be launching a special developer program that will run all through mainnet launch. We project that Febim will hit mainnet by February 2023 in a network upgrade that we are codenaming Huga. We expect to start our scoping exercises for M2.2 of the FEM roadmap by January 2023. This milestone brings user-defined WASM actors to the Filecoin network. It's hard to say when this upgrade would ship to mainnet because there are many external factors that will affect it, but we are very tentatively aiming for mid year 2023. After then, we will switch focus to user programmability to further programmability improvements, both at the FEM and the protocol layer. Our priorities for 2023 are first, to keep uh, to our estimated mainnet upgrade date for FEBIM as much as possible, which is February the 8th, 2023. Second, to tighten the scope of FEM M2.2 as much as possible to ship simple, incremental, and secure updates to the network. Third, to parallelize the development of FEM 2.2 itself with the development of tooling, SDKs, IDL, IDLs, and other components that should accompany was in programmability. Four, to continue the activation and support efforts to various developer communities through a number of programs, resources, and a lot more. Fifth, to onboard more FEM core engineers. And sixth, uh, to be ready for up for upcoming protocol upgrades and network breakthroughs like IPC, retrieval markets, compute over data, and a lot more. Thank you very much. So <clears throat> roadmap for the Phil Crypto team. So we're the team that develops um, the Rust Phil proofs library, which is a Rust-based software library, which implements the Filecoin proofs, including proof of space time, proof of replication, empty se sector update. Um, so for the next quarter in 2023, our top priority is uh, developing, delivering Halo 2 proving system to the Filecoin mainnet. So a little background on it. It's a proving system that was developed by the Electric Coin Company, um, developers of Zcash. Uh, the biggest benefit for us is that it eliminates the trusted setup process of the Groth 16 proving system, which is uh, a process where multiple actors have to contribute randomness to develop, to generate the proof parameters. It takes months to complete end to end for each, each participant to complete their part. Um, one thing to note about this is that GRAS 16 won't be going away. So um, existing storage providers who are currently using GRAS 16 will continue to operate as normal. The expectation is that new use cases um, will, and newer storage providers will also be able to use Halo, Halo 2. Um, this is something that, especially elimination of the trusted setup, um, should accelerate our ability to deliver new proofs onto the network. Um, so for the coming quarter, we're looking at getting functional parity between Halo 2 and GROS 16, um, including CPU and GPU acceleration. Um, also by the end of this quarter is we want to have the initial API available so that clients, including Lotus, um, the other third-party clients can begin starting uh, integration. Um, moving into Q1 of next year, um, we're going to optimize, see what performance is capable of it. Uh, optimization doesn't do any good without being able to benchmark everything. So we want to uh, create a benchmarking dashboard so that we can evaluate performance between GROS 16, Halo 2, and any of the additional um, proving systems that come, come out over the next year in the future. Um, Another feature targeted for Q1 is recursive proofs, um, so doing proofs of proofs. Um, and we also want to get uh, third-party code audits uh, started, as well as uh, the FIP draft, and refine the API based on feedback from um, the Filecoin clients, as well as feedback on the FIP and code audits. Um, for Q2, we want to get everything to production finalized, um, send the FIP out for approval, um, get the API finalized to go along with, with the FIP voting. 
Um, the biggest change for us will be, I think, in Q3. Um, so up until this point, uh, Filecoin Proofs has been a library that's exclusively for use by Filecoin clients. Um, we want to open it up for proofs on L2, L3 applications, um, as well as use by computer or data, um, Lurk, FVM, so uh, or off-chain proofs, um, so that we can develop new new proofs, new applications, and, and sort of open up the API to, to smart contracts. Um, another thing that we're looking into is chain snapshotting, so being able to prove that someone's storing a, a chain snapshot to enable lighter weight Filecoin clients. Thank you. So just quickly, uh, I think you saw this roadmap yesterday, but this is our highlight. Uh, we split our roadmap in development and research. So this is what we are shipping essentially next year. And then I have another slide on like more researchy things uh, to fill up the pipeline that we are emptying here. So uh, what's missing here is actually the milestone that comes in Q4. So we are launching the SpaceNet. Uh, and I have the textual version, which I, I will actually jump here just for a second. So this is a... Running Lotus-based SpaceNet is what? Like, it's Lotus-based testnet, testnet that will enable users to experiment with mere consensus. So this is the new consensus protocol that we are developing with full support for, for EVM. So that basically launches Q4, right? And then we are adding the IPC in Q1 next year. So you're not spawning subnets still from the SpaceNet in Q4. In Q1, you're spawning now subnets. This will allow applications like Saturn and Bacalao and others who are interested come to talk to us to run your own subnet. That's Q1. If you don't, if you want to share uh, like SpaceNet mainnet, you do it in Q4 already with us. And then M3 is the big thing. Uh, Q3 after testing, uh, bug fixing, whatnot, performance testing, we go to mainnet in Q3. Now coming back here, we have a, a few other. Uh, milestones notably related to EC patch. So FIP will publish a FIP for public discussion today. And please uh, join the discussion. And this is related to really small but important things that we are planning for expected consensus on mainnet. For our research roadmap, this is work in progress, so it's a bit uh, packed. The only fans, this was the highlight of yesterday, and you will hear again at Consensus Lab Summit about it. So this is something, so this is a high-level use case, web 2 like use case, with, uh, which is very important for decentralization because some people are actually uh, unbanked and they cannot do things uh, if they're not in a crypto world, so it's really important, but it exercises our whole stack. So this is what we want to do. For example, make, can we use subnets, can we use... Uh, uh, can we use Saturn as a building block to implement this? And this will exercise our whole stack. We want to focus on that. Uh, some other things are here. Uh, notably, they're relating. So we have growing team and network. For example, we are going to turn Consensus Day into a full-fledged conference run by Protocol Labs, Consensus Lab. And then we have a bunch of other ideas. We need to organize this a bit. But thank, thanks a lot. So um, I, I started with this, uh, with our team, just thinking about like what we care about the most from a user's perspective. We want security, we want to be familiar, we want to be reliable, and we want best price performance. So this is gonna be like the center point of everything you're about to see. Um, we actually have what we think are two roadmaps, one for end user and one for compute providers. Now obviously the two play off each other, but it's really important for us to think about the end user benefits that you're gonna see from each stage along here. Uh, everything you see here is backed by a lot of thinking and, and issues and things like that, but what you're about to see is really the end user, what, what they're gonna experience, um, either if you're an end user or a compute provider. So December 2022, uh, data permanence is gonna be powered by Phil Plus. Uh, we're gonna do significant performance improvements and uh, two times as many examples as we have right now. Those examples are underway. So how, what can you do with Phil, or excuse me, what can you do with Bacalhau and uh, make it great? You're also gonna have your own dashboard so you can visualize all your jobs, see how they're working, see how the network is working um, as you make uh, your own decisions on when to compute. Um, in March 2023, we'll have uh, launch support for Wasm. It's in beta right now. Um, we feel like we're going to get to um, uh, production by then, uh, meaning you won't even have to containerize your job anymore. You can just hand us code, and we'll um, compile and run it for you. 
Uh, significantly improved reliability with a lot of investments in, um, uh, in transport layer. Uh, we're going to be doing some proofs of concept with uh, other smart contracts, including FEM and, of course, Consensus uh, as they land. And we'll be, uh, our hope is to start exploring using the chain for transport rather than what we're doing right now, which is Gossip Sub. Uh, we also really want to focus on developer experience. Uh, we want a much faster REPL. Right now it takes, you know, you have to build, you have to submit, and so on and so forth. We want it to feel very native so that you make a change in your code and momentarily you're able to see that change. Uh, we are also going to hit 1.0 uh, for our API and stability, meaning we will now take legacy jobs forward and uh, that will support the net, uh, enable the network to be much more flexible, uh, more, it will uh, handle versioning and things like that. Uh, we are also going to start our grant program then and uh, what we're calling uh, Bakayao season where we're going to support people um, ramping things up and uh, prizes behind it and so on. Um, in June 2023, uh, again, a lot more uh, developer experience. We think that's really critical, including a lot of syn um, syntactic sugar, uh, or what we're calling syntactic sugar anyway. Um, you, get, you give us a big job and we'll split it up for you, we'll shred it, we'll map reduce it, so on and so forth. Uh, we think we can do a lot of really thing cool things here. Um, we'll also be supporting DAGs at that point and federated reads, including reads across sectors. Um, and then, uh, you heard uh, from many of the folks, including um, uh, from Station, for example, uh, we hope to have our rich local client. So every putty can now be a um, compute provider. You just run it on your network and um, we will, or run it on your machine, and your machine can now participate, uh, bringing back steady at home, if, uh, if I have a, any way uh, about it. And then... Um, Finally, um, in December, or excuse me, in September, uh, you hear from Consensus Lab. It's funny, I go last and uh, all my surprises are given away, right? Um, uh, but uh, you see Consensus and verification. This is going to rely heavily on the subnet and uh, incredible work that Consensus Lab is doing um, for deterministic jobs. So now you will actually have verification of deterministic jobs. Um, we will also have a website uh, integrating with Slingshot and other like data so that you will now be able to go to a website and kind of pre-select uh, a series of actions that you might want to do against a data set. So, oh, it's a very large data set. I want to shard it. I want to parallelize it. I want to whatever, kind of a no-code-like experience. Um, we're also planning on supporting arbitrary networking via gateways. So uh, the, the jobs will be able to reach out to the network and execute commands uh, through a throttled gateway um, uh, or well, obviously, we'll be exploring decentralized solutions as well, but nobody in the decentralized space has figured out arbitrary networking yet, so we're not optimistic, but we're hoping. Uh, in addition to that, nodes will be able to communicate with each other. So you can now deploy multi-node job multi jobs that can communicate each other over the life of that. Uh, that should unlock a number of uh, MapReduce jobs and, um, and other jobs of that kind. Um, on the compute provider front, um, December 2022, we will launch uh, Phil Plus. You can see that there. Um, the compute provider doing the job will be first in line to win uh, deals, including verified deals. So we're um, really excited about that. Uh, also, a lot of simplified setup stuff. Um, in March, we're going to have a unified control plane across all of your nodes. So if you're a compute provider and you have many nodes that you want to control, um, we want to give you metrics, we want to give you a dashboard, and the ability to turn them on and off without having to log into each one. Um, we also want to work really hard on a partner program for our C, uh, compute providers um, and multiple executor support. And our API for the server side will also reach um, 1.0 in March as well. Um, in June 2023, we'll support additional deal engines. Um, we're also going to get to um, BFT one third, um, uh, supporting unreliable nodes and making it much more uh, making your job much more reliable even on an unreliable network. And finally. Um, again, you heard it. Uh, you heard me give it away, or excuse me, you heard the station team give it away. Um, by uh, d September, we hope to launch the anyone can be a compute provider. You run it locally um, via the rich uh, client execution. We also plan on in uh, either building or uh, hopefully integrating with an existing reputation system. Um, and uh, I mentioned already the um, the clusters of jobs that you'll be able to do um, uh, inside you know a single data center. So uh, that's back to you. Hi, so I think now I'm the last. <laughs> no? Okay, keep going. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk about the Layer 2 Incentives Working Group within uh, Crypto Econ Lab. 
Um, and this group um, focuses on layer two research for incentives. And what does this mean? So when you think about that um, figure that Juan talks about the chasm between the research and the product, um, I think and uh, our team believes that a big important part of crossing that is actually designing the right business model and incentives to allow for scale. And so our team is supporting that and supporting all the incredible uh, new networks and new products and applications building on top of the existing stack and helping them design the right business models and incentives for scale. Um, and for this, we have three main um, objectives. So the first is to continue to support storage growth uh, with the emergence of new applications. Um, and with this, we can think of uh, applications built on FVM, but also other projects such as Atlas, which is trying to uh, build a business model and Web3 native applications for geospatial data. Um, the second one is to make sure that we can build robust and safe markets for retrievals. So you've heard from the different retrieval teams uh, that incentives are a big part of it, so we want to support them on, on that. Um, and finally, we also want to ensure that the compute markets are also incentivized and uh, the right business models are, are set up. Um, in terms of uh, the key milestones, we will have three main threads that will be um, running sort of in parallel. Um, the first is um, Saturn, so we will continue to <laughs> monitor um, the L1 network and the incentives we, we designed to make sure that everything is working as expected. Um, and also we'll start working on strategies to decentralize that structure to make it work and enable a lot of nodes uh, joining the network and in particular the L2 nodes. Um, and then we also have Atlas, which I talk about. So for here, the main milestone will be to ship an MVP and to build a community around geospatial data and research. Um, and finally, we have a, a, a work that we'll be doing with Compute Over Data and in particular with Bacalhau and um, supporting this uh, initial exploration of incentives for that um, team. So. That's it. Thank you. Hello, I'm the last one. <laughs> uh, so now we're going to look at other parts of CryptoNet that are going to look more in forward um, computing over the data on Filecoin. So. The, the description of uh, Alex yesterday that uh, Filecoin is a storage for all the computers around the uh, all of all these global computers for all the blockchain around the world can only happen if we can allow them to get access to Filecoin storage. And so we're trying to uh, work on this. And this is uh, what we call Filecoin interop and f to export Web3. And this would allow truly compute over data, not only from uh, blockchains like uh, Ethereum and so on, but also from other projects like Bacalao, Lurk, and so on. So the way we export um, the, w w the way we export it is by showing a proof of uh, the consensus of Filecoin into other chains, and that's the first milestone. The second milestone is once we have the state of Ethereum into other chains, we can do uh, we can go and read it from other chains. And so, so this is the second milestone. Reading Filecoin from Ethereum today is going to be a nightmare. So we need to improve the state of Filecoin, the way that we commit to it, so that it is uh, way simpler to generate proofs. So these are the three steps to get interrupt. Separately, we think that um, computation over data, it's very important, but it's also very important to, to have uh, access control to uh, smart contracts, not only in Ethereum, in every chain. And uh, we will be supporting this in every chain, including Filecoin. And so the idea with Medusa is that you can encrypt any IPFS hash and you can release an IPFS, the content of the IPFS hash based on some on-chain interaction. You make a payment, you buy an NFT, and so on. Medusa, uh, just for lab week, we shipped the demo on medusanet.xyz. Uh, like, so first milestone is there. And then, but we, there is many milestones ahead of time. 
Uh, one is uh, deploying the production-ready testnet in Filecoin as soon as FVM will support events. And then we want to uh, go and find some early users that would be um, supporting uh, or integrating access control in their platform. Uh, Medusa at the very beginning is going to be the MPC, so the, net, the threshold network of Medusa is going to be centralized. We will have to, meaning we will pick, like in Diran, who are the nodes running it. The goal is to find incentive for that. And in these incentive schemes is way later next year. And we want to be able, if we don't like our MPC network, you should be able to pick your own threshold group. And that's what we're doing with Medusa as well. And then uh, there are two other projects that come from the research side. Both uh, Testudo and Vector Commitments do improve Filecoin proofs. And uh, I think there is an early, oh, the graph cannot show, but there is an early result from Testudo that we do improve 4x over Grot16. This means that we could have, hopefully very soon, um, based on, on the timeline, so we do performance prediction, we, re we f finalize the paper, we implement the proofs, but the goal is that we will have bet faster proofs. This could give us faster power up, but also faster replica updates, which is a lot of people would want it. And if we can go 4 to 20 times X faster, that would be a, a big win. But the pseudo is a universal trusted setup snack, so it could be used by other projects that want to do compute over data and do proofs uh, uh, on those computation. And vector commitments, I think I told you a lot about vector commitments in multiple occasions. The idea is to replace Merkle trees as much as possible for the proof of replication, but not only for those. As I said, having good vector commitment, it is very important for exporting the Filecoin chain into other chain so that we can do easy proofs about the Filecoin state. And in general, whoever is computing over large amount of data, they will have to drop Merkle trees. And that's why we think that compute over the, if we want to compute over Filecoin state, these two are, could be very strong components. And that's it. This is the end of our NDRES Summit. Thank you guys so much for just everything. It's been awesome. Um, I hope you all have had a lot of really good conversations. I hope this does not stop now, that you continue having great conversations. Um, I have notes on groups that I want to talk to more. Um, but thank you so much. Please have an amazing lunch. Go and, and hang out and continue uh, enjoying Lab Week. <laughs>